Just a quick question regarding uh, loop quantum gravity and string theory. Um, do they factor in um, retro causality and um, quantum entanglement? And secondly, um, regarding extra dimensions in, in string theory, what could they be? Because Einstein said the fourth dimension said was um, speed, speed of light times time. For, uh, as, a, as a spatial dimension, what would be the extra dimensions in your mind? Okay. You do appreciate your two questions would involve another lecture. <laughs> I was going to say. I'm um, not entirely sure these good folks have that, so I'm going to try and answer you very, very quickly. But if you want to know more, come and, come and talk to me afterwards. So firstly, um, um, string theory and uh, loop quantum gravity, do they involve retrocausality? Not to, to, to my knowledge. Do they involve entanglement? There is, and I don't know too much about it at the moment, but actually Lee Smolin has a new book coming out. There is a lot of interest at the moment in the idea that quantum entanglement might be at the root of much of what we understand about the nature of space and time. Um, it's a fact that in loop quantum gravity, uh, what uh, Ravelli and his co-workers discovered is you can have an electron moving around on, on a spin network, and then it'll disappear and pop up over here, like it's gone through a wormhole. Now, when that kind of thing happens, theorists get an, a little bit unnerved. But in fact, that this thing is in, was entirely predicted by John Wheeler, uh, who actually had a model of electrons as tiny wormholes in the space-time continuum. So I'll leave you to make of that what you will. Um, hidden dimensions in string theory, uh, let's be absolutely clear, uh, one of the biggest differences. Um, I, at root, I've explained that loop quantum gravity is based on the notion of, of loops, of gravitational force, whatever that means. They're the objects on which the quantum field theory is, is, is built. String theory is also based on the idea of, of strings and closed loops. Closed loops in string theory are meant to be reflecting gravity. Um, but string theory demands that there's more to the three dimensions of space that we're familiar with. It needs another six dimensions of space to fold the strings um, in, uh, and it needs to tuck these away out of sight, down at the Planck scale uh, in something called a Calabi-Yau space, a peculiar mathematical object with holes. Now, there is no evidence for this. Uh, string theory also demands supersymmetry, and there's no evidence for supersymmetric particles, as Phil explained in his introduction. Um, loop quantum gravity doesn't need any of that, okay? It's a, but it's only a theory of quantum gravity. It's not trying to pretend to be a theory of everything. Okay. Thank you. Uh, two questions. Can I keep this book? <laughs> this question one. Uh, question two, you said that... Um, quantum loop gravity uh, does away with singularities. Yeah. Does that mean the start of the universe was not the Big Bang, but the period just after inflation? That, that's where the idea of a bounce comes from. So, so in, in fact, uh, because you, you, you can't... So singularities, the argument is they don't exist in nature. Um, but Penrose and Hawking developed a whole lot of theorems to say, well, we we can't get rid of them from the current theories based on general relativity. And the logic of that is because you assume space-time to be continuous. Inevitably, continuous things can go infinitely big or infinitesimally small. So it's difficult to avoid. It's, it's much more complicated than that, but that's the kind of gist of it. Um, but when you make space granular, you make it out of bits, loops, spin networks, whatever we want to think about it, you can't get smaller than that. So. Um, the universe may well have started with the very, very smallest bit of space, uh, in which case there is a view that says, well, in fact, well, maybe you know, it wasn't the birth of a universe from, from nothing, as it were, but maybe there was a universe before that collapsed and bounced to produce the universe that we know today. I'll leave you to decide whether that's a good idea or not. Could we ever know anything about that universe that came before? Um, there are uh, suggestions. Again, so uh, what, what you've got to do is you've got to reach for the bits of empirical evidence that you can work with. Things like the, the patterns in the cosmic background radiation, 
Um, I would hold some store by any observation of what are known as primordial gravitational waves. When you saw the little graphic showing what happens when two black holes, you know, dance around each other and then merge, well, you can imagine the ripples in space and time at the moment of the Big Bang would have been horrendous because that's the notionally the birth of space and time. And such disturbances in space-time are known as primordial gravitational waves. Now, there was a big hoo-ha a few years ago because there was a team of scientists who thought they'd found evidence for these, but they hadn't. Uh, it was dust in the universe. Uh, they're scientists. This is, this is what happens. Um, that's why you do science. But with more exquisite, sophisticated measurements, uh, we're planning to put, uh, I think, I don't know whether this is in just the planning stage or whether there's funding for it, but the idea is we, we literally put three satellites into orbit that triangulate. And these can, these can measure in principle gravitational waves, not on Earth, but out in, in, in orbit. Uh, it's called LISA, I think. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Basically, if, if that ever gets built and we find primordial gravitational waves, that there might be hints that there was something before. But if I feel a bit sanguine about it, it's simply because such is the state of, of the theories and there's such flexibility about how you determine them that the possibility is that loop quantum gravity will predict this. Hey, look at this. But then you know the string theorists will come and oh, well, we can predict the same. And you're no further forward. Hello. You put some formulae up on the, uh, the screen there, uh, which came from Carlo's book, By the Look of It, which describe uh, how you arrive at the granularity, the, the, the quanta. And I noticed that it involved uh, pi, and it also involved h-bar, which itself is derived from pi. Um, it doesn't seem correct that you're using a mathematics that never resolves with irrational numbers that go to the infinitely small to describe something that is supposedly absolute in, in size, dimension, or area, or whatever. Uh, is, is it that we're using the wrong mathematics to describe it? <laughs> no, no, sorry. I mean, I, I, I don't mean that. I don't. I don't mean that to be in, in any sense dismissive. It's a good question. It's not the question I thought you were going to have. I knew it was a mistake to put a mathematical equation up. Um, so, um, eight pi and, and other things like this. Bear in mind that eight pi might seem like a you know a, a number that we are used to thinking about on an earthly scale, uh, on our scale, but you're multiplying this thing called the square of the Planck length. And even when you multiply that by 8 pi, you're still talking about areas that are very, very, very small. Okay? Um, you've got to go to very, very large quantum numbers in order to be able to get something uh, that starts to make any kind of, uh, of sense. Um, it's not true that, that h and, and pi are connected. Uh, h bar is connected because it's simply Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi. And it's because 2 pi, it's a, you know, it's a circle, it comes up a lot in physics. Uh, so it's just convenient to express H uh, in, in those terms. Um, this equation, by the way, doesn't, doesn't necessarily prove that, that, uh, that space is quantum in nature. Um, everything that goes before leading up to this uh, equation proves that space is quantum in nature according to this theory. This equation is simply telling you how to calculate what's known as the spectrum of the area as a result. Jim, there's something that just disturbs me about this image, which is you've got the amoeba and you've got the galaxy. Um, and in fact, you could take this all the way down to the hydrogen atom. From the hydrogen atom to the, size, to the whole universe, yep. there is structure at every scale. But are you saying here that from the hydrogen atom down to the fabric, the, the grain of space-time, over 20 orders of magnitude, there is nothing, there is no structure? Or are there structures in between <laughs> Well, again, I mean, um, so loop quantum gravity addresses um, what um, the world might look like from, from the perspective of the Planck scale. Um, it's not 
making any conclusions about what might happen in the gulf between okay. the Planck scale and the scale of a proton, the diameter of a proton, for example, where we know quarks exist and gluons dance back and forth, holding them together. Um, uh, I, 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 I think it's fair enough to say that, that um, it, that doesn't mean to say that the two theories are detached, because as I've said, it is possible to put um, electrons on these spin networks and watch them move about and compute some things that are consistent with the way that you would compute an electron trajectory in, uh, in particle physics. So um, it, it isn't giving you any hint for what might be existing in between, but it is saying it is still nevertheless compatible. What's going on down here is compatible with what's going on up there, if that kind of answers the question. Mm -hmm. Other questions? We've got a In bit other more words, time left. Um, the, the chap, sorry, Ro actually. Um, you, you seem to be very pessimistic that there can be a definite experiment that can prove either way which of these competing theories can be correct. Because you were very pessimistic about cosmic background cosmic radiation and about primordial gravitational waves. So if you could stretch your imagination to the possibilities of technology, could, the, could, you, de could you devise an experiment that would say, yes, this theory is correct? Um, I, well, I don't want to come across as overly pessimistic. Um, I, I know that both Lee and Carlo uh, would want to argue that they do see um, uh, some hope. Um, on the other hand, I think we have just to be a little bit pragmatic. Um, what we're talking about here, even in the case of the loop quantum cosmology predictions for the high uh, scalar angle um, uh, cosmic background radiation, um, that requires a whole another satellite mission uh, to determine the cosmic background radiation temperature variation at such a high degree of precision that you might be able to make a choice. And my slight concern is that uh, theorists, whenever there was a blip uh, in the Large Hadron Collider uh, signals uh, that people thought might be evidence for a new particle, there would be, honestly, a hundred theoretical papers published within a week explaining what it was. And it's just this such versatility and, and, and such um, flexibility in the way that we currently using uh, physical theories um, to say that against that massive background of ideas, uh, are we able to make a definitive choice one way or another? Um, that doesn't mean to say that it's not possible if um, a future circular collider is built. I think Phil was saying we're in an interesting period of debate at the moment as to whether uh, this is seen to be worthwhile. But if it is, uh, my real hope is that we can actually uncover some hints about what lies underneath by looking very, very precisely at what we currently know or think we know. So instead of hoping to discover new particles, by looking at the particles we do know, like the Higgs and its interactions, then we, we might be able to get a better sense of, of where the standard model is going wrong. And where we can get that sense, we might be able to say, OK, so underneath this is something that might look like loop quantum gravity, or it might look like string theory, or it might look, look like something completely different. So don't get me wrong. I'm not a pessimist in the thing. I think this is not the end of experiment. Uh, there are some great ideas, but we're now in a situation where we might have to wait 50 years. Just like Peter Higgs himself had to wait 49 years for a theory he published in 1964, by the way, to see that uh, proved correct with the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012. Uh, he was in his early 80s uh, by the time that announcement was made. We may just have to learn to be patient. I want to squeeze one last question in because someone's been waiting in the gallery for it. Um, I hope it's a quick one. I can't see it. Okay, I can see the hand there. Yes, please. You showed a picture of a lattice. Yes. And a picture of some knots and a picture of some rings. If I were a Planck length high, or maybe the square of a Planck length high, what, what would I actually see? What's the picture you have in your head when you think about this at that level? <laughs> I, 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 honestly, I try not to have a picture. <laughs> I, 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 really, I really don't. Um, and I know Einstein was a great one for his thought experiments where he'd imagine himself riding on a photon and what does the world look like from that perspective. Um, 
we're in an area now of exploration from a theoretical perspective where this notion of visualizability has gone completely out of the window. Um, you've got to bear in mind that what I'm here reaching for is, is graphical images to try and convey some essence. What people like Lee and Carlo are interested in is the mathematical structures. Uh, you can read into the mathematical structures whatever you like to make sense of what's going on, but it's a work um, and often a frustrating work to try and take those theoretical structures and turn them into something that you can visualize. Um, which is why, you know, uh, Carlo runs around Verona buying up all the key rings, uh, because the idea is, okay, maybe space uh, is a weave, uh, I can put that together with a whole bunch of different key rings and at least get some sense for what it might look like that I can then talk to journalists about, uh, um, uh, if nothing else. So um, it's a real challenge. Um, it's a um, um, it, it's it, it's something that I think is is not going to get any easier. Um, I could show you a Calabi-Yau shape used in string theory, but I, would, it, would it mean anything? I, I kind of very much doubt that. So you 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 face this this challenge for science popularizers like Phil and myself. It's a very very tough challenge. Yeah, and a great question. Will the maths Very good be question. enough? Thank you, but we will have to leave it there. Please join me in thanking Jim Baggins again. <laughs>